All right, everybody. Welcome back to Brooklyn Raga Massive's weekly online session. Uh, Brooklyn Raga Massive is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to, uh, well, Raga music and Raga inspired music. And uh, we love to take trips around the world with lots of different people. Of course, this weekly series used to be in person. Ah. Uh, excuse me for technical difficulties there, but um, this weekly series used to be uh, in person and we had a jam session afterwards and that's how we got to know lots of people uh, in our community and, and really built, built up the community by having an informal session, you know, where we can all kind of listen to each other, play and play with each other and get ideas and network and, and just have a drink together and, you know, um, so we look forward to hopefully returning to that possibly this fall, uh, maybe even a monthly jam session there. Uh, we've had a few live in-person concerts um, over the summer. Uh, most recently, our ND performance uh, inspired by Terry Riley's NC. Uh, look out for some more of those uh, in the fall. And of course, this weekly series, uh, we're really uh, lucky to feature many different artists who have play Indian music or uh, South Asian music or other music from around the world. And, um, you know, we're just going into their living rooms and finding out what they do. And today we're really lucky to have Chris Stevens with us. Hey, hey thanks for having me, Neil. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. Now, Chris reached out to us earlier this year uh, saying he's moving to, to the Hudson Valley area. Now, yep. newly, newly res uh, resident of uh, Red Hook. Right. Yeah. That's the Red Hook Upstate. Yeah, not Red yeah, Hook in Brooklyn, but Red <laughs> Hook Upstate. Um, but uh, so so he reached out to introduce himself, and uh, you know we don't have our jam session where which we would normally invite him. So we're happy to feature him in this series. Chris is a multi instrumentalist, and <laughs> and is the one man Silk Road uh, musician. And um, so welcome, Chris. Um, yeah. You know, I've been following Brooklyn Raga Massive for about 10 years, since you guys started, really. Okay. Just All watching right. from a distance, you know, like, this is awesome, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I was always a fan of Pandit Krishna Bhatt. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, knew my that, Guruji, yeah. Yes, yes. And I knew that he was in New York, and I knew that also Anindo Chatterjee was in New York. And so I've just been watching, you know, I'm from Missouri, I, way, you know, far away, as far as you can get from New York culturally. And so I've just, you know, I'm so excited to be here and be close to, to Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. And, and ho hopefully, yeah, those in-person things, if those ever come back, I'm driving down as soon as it happens. <laughs> all right. All right. We welcome, we, well, we want to feature you at some time. So uh, you're going to present uh, short pieces on many instruments, and we'll have a little discussion uh, about that. Where, where do you want to start? You know, in my live performances, in my concerts and, you know, workshops and demonstrations and stuff, I usually start with the oud because, of you know, it's the so it's, it's kind of established that it's the oldest of the lutes. Okay. It goes back to the area now that is Iraq and Iran. You know, there's just so much historical evidence that, um, showing that an instrument like this existed 5,000 years ago or so, you know, it's just okay. so old. And the word oud got transliterated into lute through Arabic and, you know, Greek, the lute or the lauta and, uh, you know, Roman, you know, they all, so the lute, the guitar, you know, these things all kind of came from that. And so did all of these other instruments that you see behind me and really any kind of thing that you do this with. <laughs> You right, know, it, right. It traces its ancestry back. You know, it shares a common ancestry uh -huh. with with the the oud. Yeah. So I usually start there. Okay. Yeah. The please. And it's also kind of geographically <laughs> in 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 the starting point of human civilization. Uh, you know, to begin with. Okay. You know, that's where first civilization started. So you know, I like to start with with the oud and talk about it. Just give a nice you know visual of this this instrument. So these are strips of wood that are heated 
over um, uh, like a hot like metal steam that molds the wood like this, and then they're glued together inside on a mold. And it's got you know the soundboard here with little braces inside it. So you know there's been so many innovations and construction methods to increase the sound, increase the lifespan of the instrument, but this this angled neck here is usually the telltale sign that you're dealing with an oud. Right, or and a lute. The, the fretlessness, <laughs> which is an adjective that I like, fretlessness. Um, so it's a, you can play all of the microtones. You're not limited to the 12 tone fretted uh, guitar piano system. So, you know, Arabic music uses lots of um, Quarter tones maybe isn't the right word because it's not a quarter of between, but uh, microtones. So they're, they're a smaller distance away than a half step. And it's played with this kind of pick here, which traditionally would be made of eagle quill. They would be flattened and soaked in olive oil sometimes to soften it and make it bendable. But now, you know, the Syrian black eagles kind of endangered and you don't want to take its feathers. So they just use nylon. Uh, hmm. since about you know 1920s or 30s but it's the same shape some people still use the feather supposedly there are ethical feather mining <laughs> methods that you know some people like that but yeah basically this long flat pick that you hold like this and this the strings you can see here double course so two strings uh tuned together as one just doubles the volume really it makes it have that nice loud boomy sound Sure. Yeah. But um, I'll just give a little demonstration on the oud here. Um, this is going to be a, uh, what is called top scene, which is um, improv an improvised introduction uh, to the melodic framework that, that is used in Arabic music repertoire called maqam. This is very analogous to the raga and the alap section. The alap. Yes. The unmetered, no rhythmic cycle. I'm not counting a beat. And you're just you're just sort of introducing, presenting um, the musical framework that, that you'll be presenting in your you know concert if you have a whole band or you know whatever. This is usually how players demonstrate their their uh, abilities, their their dedication to the instrument, um, and it's kind of like a guitar solo where it's like. It's improvised, so that way you know, like, you know, you can kind of give it your own unique flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is this will be a top scene in Makam Rust, which is kind of like the major scale, but the third note is um, like a half flat or like a double sharp, one of those weird <laughs> non twelve twelve notes, and it modulates to can different you, makams. Yeah. Can you demonstrate that? Sure. So I'll play um, like just that, just that, how that, that, that third, like a real um, true major third, just yeah. major third. And so this will be C. That's like, and then the minor third. And the rest uses this note. they call it neutral it's not um major or minor it's neutral mm -hmm. um that's you know there's many different ways to describe these words in persian the word is koron um, but it's it's basically one of those in between notes that, that give it that nice flavor of, i don't know indescribable you know because you know if you've never heard these notes before it's just like what is this it's like eating a new flavor that you've never even discovered right. somewhere between sweet and savory or something, you know? Right. Um, so I'll play a little tapsim in Makam Rast. I'll start here on Rast. This name of the note here is Rast. Just C. And it will go D all the way to G, A, D flat, and C, all the way up the octave. That's Rast. 
but the real fun is in modulating, weaving different makams together, usually just by changing the tonic, moving up up the scale and increasing uh, the pitch of your tonic. So mm -hmm. I'll give a little demonstration of that. I'll go from makam rust to makam hijaz, which is the uh, quintessentially uh, Middle Eastern Arabic scale that everybody. <laughs> In, in Hindustani music, that would be Basant Makhri right. or uh, Hijaz Barab, it's sometimes called. Yeah. short um, modulation from from rust so that's all improvised you know it's it's focusing is it's unmetered like I said there's no rhythmic cycle you're just kind of shaping the, the melody you're, you know it's, it's similar to a lot in, in Indian music where you're you're just sort of describing something in very you know simple and flowing terms so now and when, you, when you really dive into it then when you modulate, uh, so you said you were, you started the the new sa the new tonic right. came from like another degree of the scale. You're changing. The so tonic. that one you switch the tonic to the fifth. So C okay. here. Makamas when they're modulated together, so like this would be called shahnaz mm -hmm. when it uses when it mixes rust and hijaz. When it uses that, that's the, that. This is rust, and this is hijaz. But in the middle, you have shahnaz. So there's uh -huh. lots of different combinations and, and and different ways to just like little Lego pieces you fit together, you know, or, or right. All right. yeah, it's 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 um. That's the specialty of Arabic music is the ability to modulate between keys. So most of the other instruments behind me have a solid tonic, you know, like, you know, the sitar. You can't change the chikari strings. They're always, for me, C sharp, you know, so you don't play in any other key than C sharp, basically. But with, yeah. with theater, you know, you can change your key. And so they use that, you know, in, in, in their, their music to, to modulate, which is, mm -hmm. is unique to Arabic music. Uh, among the instruments that I play anyway. So most of the other ones will will stay in one key and not modulate so much. Yeah. There are things like that, like ragmala, where you can string different ragas together, but still your tonic is the same. Sure. Yeah. And um, uh, where are we going next? Well, you know, I thought I would just kind of say that I'm self-taught. So I listened, I learned by mimicking um, like master musicians that I really was drawn to. So like people like Munir Rashir, who was a great Iraqi oud player, he tuned differently. He tuned to a high F and he has his own unique tuning. 
but I loved his music. It's very meditative. He was influenced a lot by Indian raga music. He has um, some some albums that kind of show that. And uh, I believe one of his albums is named Raga, from Raga to Makam or something like that. Oh yeah. You guys, yeah. So you know, this was back in the eighties, I believe. So I was very drawn to him uh, because I had already played sitar and I could already hear that kind of improvised melodic meandering a lot of style vibe. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm by no means like an authoritative ethnomusicologist. You know, I'm not. I I just love the improvised aspect of it and have absorbed so many different kinds of oud music from Morocco. I love um, Saeed Sharabi and Nasser Harari from Morocco. I love, you know, Egyptian masters. There's so many Egyptian oud masters, Farid al uh, For example, um, there's Turkish oud players, Iranian oud players, they're in the Gulf. There's so many different kinds of oud music. And I just sort of mix them all <laughs> together to what I can, can do, you know. I've, so um, anybody who's interested in learning about uh, real, real Arabic music, um, I have a, a master list of all the musicians that have influenced me on my webpage, webmusician.co. I would encourage anybody to check that out and see, you know, hear, hear the most the real authentic stuff that inspired me to make this kind of music and kind of informs it. But, you know, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not uh, trained by any Ostav or Guru or, or anyone like that. So um, I'm very much self-taught. And so my music might deviate a little from the canonical <laughs> recordings of masters. Yeah. Sure, sure. And then about, also a lot of that music is uh, transcribed, right? So yes. you, you can learn that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they have musical forms that are pre-composed like Samai and um, Longa. These, these are things that are written down and, and memorized and played with, you know, an ensemble. But what draws, what drew itself to me was the solo improvised aspects of that all these traditions share. So just a person, a lute and a free, <laughs> a freedom, you know, that's what really drew me to it. Yeah. So they kind of all share that, um, but that is by no means the norm. You know, they, they usually meant, meant to play with a percussion ensemble or a singer or a, sure. another instrument of some kind. Um, but, you know, I, I really like the soloist aspect of it. And so yeah. that's kind of what I focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think from there we could move to, uh, you know, just traveling this way okay. from the Middle East to Iran. Um, this instrument is a tar, which is kind of the national instrument of Iran and also Azerbaijan. They play a different version of, um, but it's they're both called tar, and um, the construction methods are, are quite similar. Double belly, you know, chamber here, and the frets have microtonal increments, so they're not just twelve. Well, frets like so that that rust note and the frets are a string that's tied on the frets are actually made of sinew which is um you know like a twisted and dried animal byproduct of skin i believe or intestine okay. or something so this is a but not a vegan instrument by any means <laughs> we've got camel bone here we've got water buffalo horn we've got leather we've got this skin which is made of the uh, amniotic sac of a lamb with horn and the like umbilical lining mm. comes out in this weird <laughs> weird very weird material wow. and they dry it and then you can get it wet again and stick it on there with glue and it, it makes that resonator and the pick here, this is this is called mezrab, which you know comes from the Arabic word for paddle or oar or something, but it is also the word that sitar uses for its pick. So this is the the mezrab. It's a piece of uh, bronze, and this is beeswax that covers it. So you grip it like you can just hold it in your hand like this, and um, that's how the strings are plucked. Mm -hmm. So. 
I'll give a little um, demo on the tar. I'll play some Iranian inspired traditional music, which uses a system called Desktop, which is uh, translates to like hand position, hand placement. Dust is hand and dog. It's like um, place kind of is a loose translation. Similar to uh, Raga and Makam, again, you're you're improvising based on certain themes that have rules that you memorize a little bit. You know, it's it's a very fuzzy thing to, to pin down into words. But there's basically in, in Iranian music, what is unique is that they have they have it all written down um, called the radif. Radif means row or line in Farsi. So these are like little like minute long melodies, maybe even shorter 30 second melodies that you listen to and internalize within you somehow and then use those to improvise and, mm -hmm. and draw from. So it's just really fascinating how how people how different you know these traditions get get their music you know improvised but also able to be passed down and taught because it's very difficult to teach improvised music you know it's like yeah well that stuff. also means that it it is changing a lot and yeah. you know we like to say that you know indian classical music is thousands of years old but really okay. Really, the the way it's played now, even the the structure of ragas, yeah. you know, is all new in the last hundred years or less, you know. Yeah, it's very similar to like language, like speech. Like you could say that Hindi has been a language for you know thousands of years, but really, Hindi is only the language that you hear now. You know, like yeah, it changes so much that it's someone from today wouldn't be able to understand English, you know, at the time of Shakespeare, you know, but there's still English, right? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's just kind of uh, an ever changing, an arbitration to say that they're the same thing, you know? Right. So, but when you write things down and, and are able to teach them, then yeah, you get a little bit of, of uh, connection with the past and, you know, yes. the ability to, to teach. So I'll play a desktop called Homayun, which um, uses this this note here, this coron on the sixth note. So this is like an A, almost half flat. It's tuned C, G, A, coron, and F. Uh. And um, it's very similar to the makam in that uh, it's tetrachords, so like three or four notes here will be like the daughter mod, which is like the improvised introduction, a lot of toxin. These are the same. They share this this concept of opening with a free form, unmetered improvised section. Mm -hmm. and the daughter mod will, will uh, focus on these notes. <laughs> As the music progresses, you can move into up, you know, up to different tetrachords. This one would be like chuckleback. So you're focusing on the tonic, and then you could move um, up to focusing on the second, which would be bidad. And then the conclusion, um, the the high point, the crescendo, almost like the jala of this of the dusk performance in Homayun, is um, a melody called Oshok. those those four basic sections together you know home Yun has several the little melodies are called douche and they're like a minute long maybe and so i have a recording i have several recordings of the ready 
played by different people, of different versions of the Red Eve. So I just listen to these and try to memorize them and play along with them and then see how other artists improvise within those Boucher. Because if you just like search on, you know, Spotify or Apple Music for these obscure Persian words, you'll get results. You can get recordings of tar players, of any Santor players, Nay players, anyone. Um, so this music is all out there. It's just hiding in plain sight. Just go on any sort of internet streaming device and type in like Luce Bidad and you'll get something, you know, and you can hear how this uh, this very basic melody gets turned into these huge improvisations. It's really, really amazing. Mm. So I'll give a little demonstration in Dostka Homayu. There's different rhythmic sections. I played uh, some of the Luches I'll, I'll, I'll um, name. There were, uh, there's like a, a rhythmic section that is similar to um, Jala or like a Drukat, where you have a droning open string. <laughs> I 
jaw. Maybe yeah, even a jaw. Kind of. You have a basic rhythmic pulse. Yeah. And you're not really counting um, a melody. You're not keeping time with a drum or anything. So it's just kind of, yeah, like a jaw, like that kind of. This is called Shahar Mezrab. Yeah. Shahar means four and Mezrab. So you're basically like one, two, three, four. And there's um, some of these are set to poetry. This one is called Kereshme, which is a, a, a poetic uh, rhythm, uh, rhythm that's based on a poem called Kereshme. So you can play that in any of the couches. That's just a rhythmic pattern. Um, the, one of the most unique things about this instrument is that the, you, I don't know if you can see up close, but the strings are double coursed, similar to the oud, but they're farther apart. So you can play two two different notes on the same string. So right. so you get that dissonant, but you're doing a tremolo, so it's kind of like. Very unique. You can't do that on any other instrument that I know of. <laughs> well, and then the uh, the kind of the top two strings are also tuned diff to different notes, right? They are for this the, for this tuning of Homa. This they tuning, are. yeah, uh, yeah. But this isn't a standard tuning. It's usually tuned C G C. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a newer, innovative tuning uh, that some uh, tar players use. Um, I, I first heard it um, by a tar master. Uh, Motebesam, who's uh, based in the Netherlands, I believe. And he played, I have his album of Homayun, and I learned a lot from that. So a lot of those pieces uh, came from that album. That's his Shahar Mandra, that's from uh, Hamid Motebesam. Mm -hmm. So uh, shout out to him. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So that's that's a very brief intro to the, the Iranian tar. So I've been playing that instrument for about six years now. I've been learning the Radif, listening to it, playing along. Um, there, are, there are several Radifs. Um, the most famous one is by Mirza Abdullah, so most of the famous academic um, Iranian musicians will use that because it was the first one, I believe. But there have been several attempts to, they're basically trying to write down these improvised patterns and, and standardize them almost. So, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's an interesting, interesting way to, to form the music. Yeah. I just want to let people know that if they have any questions for Chris, you should type them right here in the chat. And uh, yeah, nice. And of course. We'll yeah. Ask him, you know, uh, yeah. So I'll move to sitar. This was my, um, this was my first instrument that I really got into besides the guitar. So um, back in, you know, it's, it's been, 20 or so years now since I've been playing the sitar. And as I was saying earlier, you know, I studied very briefly with Ustad Imrat Khan Sahab. And he taught me the very, very basics and um, really inspired me uh, with his knowledge of the history of the instrument, the Persian origins of the instrument. And so that's that was sort of planted the seed of just like oh, all this is all this music is connected. It's so beautiful to show these connections and these little lines, you know, across history of, of just you know, right exchange evolution of, of musical ideas and expressions. Well, so, tar yeah. of course, tar of course means string. And yes, say is three <laughs> I in Farsi. The name. You can, yeah, you can it's tell in it's the in the name. name. Yeah. Yeah, say it was three in Farsi and then moved to India. Say tar, far. right, exactly. So and that was 20 strings or right. and 18, both... 19, 17, depending on how you like it. But... Right, <laughs> but they do share similar, many similarities, the main one being that you just play with the index finger. The index finger is all you need. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's nice to have your thumb to anchor you, but really all you need is the, for the yeah. sitar and it's sitar <laughs> or the index finger. Um, so I'll... I'll give a little um, performance here on the sitar. I'm sure most people know what this instrument is. It's, it's, it's definitely uh, more, more familiar. Might, 
Brooklyn or all that massive crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might give a rundown of the kind of how the strings are. Uh, maybe right. Maybe some listeners out there who don't know. For sure. So close here. We've got two bridges here. The top strings. Drone strings. Uh oh. They vibrate underneath on their own. Um, the specialty of the sitar, in my opinion, what makes it, what sets it apart from other instruments is this right here. It's called mean. You're bending the string, you're pulling it downwards and, and getting those, uh, glissando, I believe would be the, the Italian, <laughs> English right. classical, you know. Name and trying it. trying to imitate the human voice, of course. Yeah, you want to yeah. you want to be able to sing what you play. Uh... Yeah, so not a lot of. You want to be able to make it round and smooth and have lots of subtleties in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So similar, like I said, it, these the the tar and the oud have a similar. Um, tradition of opening the performance with an unmetered improvised section. So the, the oud is called popsim. The tar uses garamad, and sitar uses what is called ala, which is you're just basically starting. You're introducing the raga. You're getting to know it. You're getting the 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 instrument. You know, used to playing this, these notes. You know, there's many different ways to think about it. Um, so I'll play a little a lap and a gut in rag kafi. <laughs> So I'm, I'm most inspired um, by Beautiful. my two favorite sitar players are Ustad and Mount Constant Hub, of course, um, 
his his way of playing. He always had a smile on his face. He was having so much fun, always you know being playful and uh, making it very a, a much a joyful experience. Uh, you know, playing music and, and he was just a very happy person when he had a cigar in his hands. And um, Pundit Nikhil Banerjee is my, of, of course, you know, just yeah. widely regarded as as the premier sitar player of the world. His his form, his tone, his everything about his music is is just perfect as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I never got to meet him or study with him, so uh, we only have these precious recordings that. Um, I, I, I draw my, my inspiration from. So my, my playing is kind of a mix of these two different schools of, of sitar playing, the Etuagarana, the Mahargarana. Um, usually people play one or the other. <laughs> you know, or, you, you know, know I, these... whoever your teacher is, you know, I mean, that's how teachers work. They, they teach you the way that they play. And so you end up sounding like that um, to some extent. I mean, of course you have your own natural innate expressions of yourself and it sounds like no one else but uh there's a certain style an element of some continu continuity between these generations you know sure sure but even my well, teacher kind of outside of that though so my teacher krishna Bhatt, pandit krishna Bhatt, he would say that he also plays gayaki you know he's solidly yes. maha garana you know so yes. he would study with nikhil Banerjee and ravi shankar is his right guy. uh but you know, he they, they follow the 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 Gaiki Young literally means following the vocal style, right? So, yes. Uh, you know, they it would say that they that they do that. You know. Yeah. And, incorporate and it's true. Things. I mean, of course, everyone's inspired by each other. You know, the people from yeah. one when I go to concerts of another Garana, and they're like, "Oh, that's a new way to approach that," yeah, or course. that's a new kind of you know gum up or something. Yeah. And now, and of course, just the way, the same way that you've learned, you know, so many things from around the world is our access to the recordings of, you know, yeah, of, of, right, uh, all, you, yeah, all, everything, like, and you can. I'm still, I'm uh, still discovering it. new, new things that are just buried out there. Oh, it's endless. Yeah. One of my latest uh, discoveries is um, the Punch Garana of Pakistan with uh, Ashraf Sharif Khan. Um, and the the whole Punchawali Garana of, of sitar players from Pakistan. Okay, and they have their it. own total unique style. It's just amazing. There's just so many small little nuances and subtleties um, mm. between even just the sitar. You know, there there's just an endless world in there. Mm. Um, so you know, it's 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 fun to be able to listen to it all, absorb it all try to combine it all and get it all out you know yeah, yeah. so i have a question as a musician yeah. what is your it, what is your practice session like for me you know just keeping up with sitar is is and i play a little percussion too and you know try to keep up practice on yeah on that is in, yeah i don't i don't have enough time in this lifetime yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> there's just not enough time in, in in our, our, our little existence here to, to, to fully learn or understand or develop our capabilities through practice. So my typical session is just, I spend about maybe 20 minutes on each instrument a day. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's true. Just switching back Dedication. and forth between them, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, just making sure I don't forget how to play them. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting better at switching between them quickly is yeah. something that i try to to work on because that takes the most just switching lanes completely wow. in your head yeah. your fingers you know and in, inevitably i end up playing like tar melodies on the sitar or you know right it all, that was my but, next question for yeah, sure. yeah no that it all just sort of melts together you know mm -hmm. but i think that's okay <laughs> yeah yeah it's beautiful it's your this amazing so yeah, next, you have. yeah, next this 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 instrument here just it ate about five years of my life, <laughs> just completely uh, got sucked into the the world of Chinese music, traditional Chinese pipa repertoire, 
He does. This instrument also has a long tradition of um, of music to draw from, and it's, it employs a soloist playing a lute. You know, that's that's just what I what I found to be most intriguing and something that was common between even Chinese and Arabic music, which seem so vastly different. Um, but they both have a reverence for just a person and a lute. So, you know, I, I had to I had to get in with it. Um, the thing that sets it apart from everything else is that it is totally memorized. All the pieces are are scores that you learn usually from a teacher. Um, I have my my ways of <laughs> uh, memorizing pieces. So I'll I'll play some of uh, or I'll probably just have time to play one uh, piece of music from the classical tradition of the Chinese pipa. But I'd like to talk about this instrument for a little bit too. I'm not sure if our time is running out or not. Well, it's uh, eight forty-seven, but you know, we okay, have some time. Yeah. yeah, great. That's that's perfect. So as you can tell, I'm taping nails to my fingers right now. Right. So in the olden days, when the strings were made of silk, twisted, twisted and soaked in turmeric silk, so the bugs don't eat them. Um, you could play with your fingernails, similar to the way uh, a lot of the Central Asian lutes, like the tambor, are played, and they use, still use silk strings. So you can tell that this instrument came from Central Asia, Persia, Turkic instruments. And that they still use their fingers to play, but now that they've up upgraded to metal strings, no more fingernails. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you tape little acrylic nails onto your wow. fingers like this, all five of them, even the thumb. And you yeah. play um, in outward strokes, similar to flamenco guitar. Mm -hmm. Not like the banjo, which goes in. Mm -hmm. These go out. Yeah. And so it's got four strings. It, um, this bamboo bridge and uh, the, all these frets are just tuned to normal, like piano keys, a, it's tuned to A440. So a lot of standardization has happened with this instrument. You know, usually there were regional tunings, fret placements, sizes, you know. But is it more, it's more just intonation though, as opposed to- It is, it is fully to... compatible with like a European piano, symphony, Western tradition. Oh, so, so yeah. So so no, it's a tempered. It's the, uh, the equal, equal, equal temperament. temperament. Equal yeah. temperament. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, everything is 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 tuned uh, to be compatible with um, Western orchestration. Yeah. So you know, there's probably something to be said about that <laughs> through China's history of cultural changes, maybe even revolution <laughs> but um so the, the instrument has, has definitely gone, undergone a lot of changes since then mm -hmm. so there used to be these frets were missing so they weren't capable of playing like because you that doesn't exist in chinese music the half step is almost unheard of mm. you know you're only going to play you're not going to that's like japanese music it's like for the shamisen or koto, they use those half steps. But Chinese music is very like stereotypically almost pentatonic. You know, that's that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so these frets were added. You know, this is all in like the the since you know probably 1960 or 50 or so. It's all been standardized since then. So it's A to A440 here, and A D E. And then A you get the octave. So one four five one is the is the open string tune. Hmm. Um, but similar to the sitar, the strings are very loose and the frets are very wide, so they bend. You get those microtones and those very subtle little nuanced you know, microtonal flavors mm -hmm. uh, that, that is present in all Eastern music, all Oriental music. Um, uses some kind of microtone, um, some kind of non-piano <laughs> notes, you know. So that's a little overview of the pipa. 
Um, it's, it came, you know, it's similarly like teardrop shaped or maybe pear shaped. Um, this instrument came from the oud through the Silk Road, trading with, um, you know, Chinese merchants picked up this instrument from, it used to be played like this, played with an instrument or a plectrum, you know, similar to like a, um, a bachi, which is used on a shemison, like a big, long spatula looking thing almost. But it's been held upright and played with the fingers. And that's just kind of the standard way of playing it nowadays since, you know, I mean, you know, since the 19, certainly since, you know, 1960s or so. So, um, like I said, all this music is memorized. So I'll play um, a piece that is uh, part of the traditional Chinese repertoire of the kipak. So they usually are um, associated with stories, poems, you know, plays, even sometimes theater, theatrical productions. I um, wonder which one I should play. How would you say, how would, old would you say this piece is? Um, so there's been a lot of reconstruction of lost, seemingly lost manuscripts of Chinese writings, like notation systems from around 1812. So um, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on my names and dates, but so this, this piece has at least been in uh, the conservatory taught as a standard piece since, you know, 1900 or so, but uh, it was originally reconstructed from a manuscript in 1812. Who's to say how old the piece was before it was written down? You know, these are very old, lost, lost to the sands of time. You know, the story that it tells about um, goes back to 300 BC. So this is a story of a princess who was exiled from her village. She was offered as a, as a bride to a neighboring tribe. <laughs> And so it's a very sad, somber piece that's called On the Frontier. Uh, it's, uh, it depicts her riding a horse, playing the pipa, leaving her village in China to go be the wife of some neighboring tribes. And so it's kind of a sad piece. And it, it, it's meant to depict her journey on horseback, playing the pipa from her village to, to beyond the frontier where she's going to go be a be some stranger's wife, you know? So these, these are very old stories and, and the music sort of goes in different sections. So this, is, this one is called On the Frontier. This is a frontier song.
a very slow and somber piece. You know, there's also a very, uh, another way of playing the piva, which is very fast and rhythmic and virtuosic, mm -hmm. which uh, it, um, requires a lot of difficult extended playing techniques. One of the most right. famous uh, pieces, you know, drawn to that slow somber kind of sound you know um, but some of the techniques that I, I'd like to to sort of break down on this instrument so like I said I have these five picks on my fingers here they, they use a similar technique in, like a banjo roll um, that is called loon which means wheel so similar terminology even to the banjo there's like a circular motion to the movement of the fingers here I'll try to See if you can see it up close, but this is like a uh, basically like how you hold a pick and play tremolo, or you play a misrob, hold a tremolo. You're basically just playing tremolo like doing this. One, two, three, four, and then thumb. You know, there's an extended technique where you can make little click sounds. Um, this instrument is capable of many non non musical sound effects. Um, and those extended techniques are written into the the scores. Absolutely, they are like put into the sheet music. Yeah, so like cross the strings and make it sound horrible. Yeah, yeah things like that. You know, wow. put your finger underneath the string. Those are all part of, you know, the composition. So yeah, yeah, they use they use that sort of dissonance and uncomfort, <laughs> uncomfortable sounds in their compositions, usually to convey uh, battles, military endeavors, yeah. wars, um, clashing, fighting. You know, the the more uh, virtuosic and fast paced. Um, type of pipa playing is actually called the martial style, like uh, it, it depicts military mm -hmm. uh, battles and things like that. And a lot of those extended techniques are used in, in those pieces to mimic the sound of like fireworks, guns, cannons, horses trotting, you know, drums mm -hmm. playing, all, all kinds of, of sound effects. So yeah, that's just a, an extra cool part about the pipa. <laughs> yeah. um, but you can tell that you know I'm bending the string exactly like I would on the sitar, like away, pulling pulling down away from yeah. me. Um, so that's how they get those those juicy microtones that that you know give it that distinct flavor. How many steps can you bend? Well, see the frets here. This is my longest fret, the octave. And it can go up to the fourth. Yeah, the other ones you run out of fret because they don't. It doesn't go that far. Yeah. But you know you risk breaking the string too. So the the microtones are more are more for just subtle little. So you very rarely just play a note as it is on the fret. You usually give it a little warble of some kind yeah yeah um similar to uh the gojeng i don't know if you've ever heard of that instrument or not but it's like it goes this way it's a zither and they push down on the notes this way behind the bridge okay so that's that's a similar a similar technique that uh that i believe the people is trying to mimic okay by, by giving every note a little subtle little oscillation right uh, uh -huh. sort of like uh in rag darbari they have andola on the sixth and sure. third note that's that's a, a nice analog to, to describe it's a very particular kind of vibrato in a way yeah 
you're you're almost not even playing the right note you know you're you're oscillating between the the correct harmonic pitch and uh, like a the next you know sharp version of it yeah but that's what gives it that that very subtle poetic flavor the flavor um so i'll move on to my last one this is my latest instrument i've only i've got this earlier this year in, in uh february uh, this is a turkish balama sometimes called saz which is a persian word it just means instrument um but it's basically in construction a long neck fretted food <laughs> and it has frets similar to the persian tar they almost entirely match up um with the but uh there's their double sharps are a little sharper and they also have you know a couple of extra frets here and there mm -hmm. so as you might expect turkish arabic and persian instruments that all have relatives <laughs> related related concepts um that's what happens when your neighbors you know when you share thousands of years of history you know for sure so yeah this this music is a folk instrument it's usually meant to accompany um or, or, or it's it's kind of separate from the ottoman music tradition of classical music with the oud and the kanun and all of the other you know um instruments that are shared with the middle east um the Comanche, the ney these are all instruments that are used in the ottoman classical music tradition and you know still today outside of that but this instrument is more like um the turkish central asian instruments um like the tambor uh the dotar instruments like that so big um you know bowl backed long neck skinny necked instrument that um is mostly associated with like anatolian folk music um, so in, in the Arabic tradition, this instrument, a similar instrument is called the bazook. And, you know, Greek has the bazooki. So, yeah, these are all kind of related instruments. Um, but it has actually three, three courses in one. So it's got the, this octave and then two. This is one course, three strings in one. So it, it, it's extra loud. <laughs> and the sound hole is back here. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll play. They they also use the word taksim to be uh, to mean improvisation, unmetered improvisation. So like I said, I'm very much a newbie on this instrument. I'm I'm still figuring out different techniques and discovering uh, new recordings from from my my favorite um, musicians who play the saz, the balama saz. Uh, there's also a longer necked version. So this is more of a folk instrument, um, but it's been expanded to uh, a more classical setting. Um, Kayan Kalhor, you've heard of him? Of course, player. yeah. He plays with uh, um, Erdal Erzimjan, who plays this instrument. Ah. He plays the longer neck version. And so they're, you know, that the music that they're making is just, from heaven, it's just amazing, and so he's he's kind of expanding the repertoire of this instrument, kind of taking it out of the dance and folk song setting and into a more like uh, artsy, I guess you know, setting. So it's tune A, G, D. So very strange very different from any other tune yeah. you have a step down which just requires a whole new way to think about where your fingers go <laughs> mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll just give a little demo on this you know like i said i'm not i'm not an expert on this instrument by any means but i just like the way it sounds i got this uh from a friend from turkey um back in kansas city um serdar thanks <laughs> mm -hmm. um but um so i i decided to, to try and pick it up i mean it, and it also fits with my whole vibe of solo 
loops from yeah. the Silk Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got to yeah. have them all. Yeah. <laughs> surprised <laughs> and yeah one of the special techniques on this instrument is that you put you can put your thumb here on the third third fret and change your tonic to B flat and F instead of A and D Lots of hammer ons, hammer and pull, you know. I imagine uh, it's very similar to tar techniques. It is. The, I play it very similar to the tar. Um, it has its own, you know, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm just starting out. There's a, I'm sure there's it has its some own. kind of distinction that that i i, I haven't quite <laughs> figured out uh how to how to properly mimic but um to me when i listen to balama players it sounds nothing like guitar they're they're playing something entirely unique there's just a, 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 a some kind of nuance that that uh i haven't quite figured out how to mimic yet but yeah it is it is very similar to the tar uh, they're both, you know, they both use the same microtonal frets. You're both playing it with a misrob, so you can get those triplets really fast and get to play the open strings, you mm -hmm. know, in unison and things like that. So similar technique, but, um, you know, they don't have the, the same concept of, like, best gaw and, and whatever. And they're, they're mostly based on, like, bardic songs, you know, these yeah. traveling uh musicians who you know go to weddings and festivals and things they have these their whole a whole different tradition so there's lots lots of lots for me to learn there but it's only been you know eight months or so since i've been playing so, so <laughs> i hope hope to figure it out someday how is your music uh besides learning learning this instrument how is your music would you say kind of changed or evolved during the pandemic times oh yeah i spent a lot i mean i think psychologically <laughs> is the main thing like you're not playing to prepare for a concert you're no longer practicing you know in anticipation of some performance so you're just playing for fun because it's fun <laughs> you're just enjoying you know your time playing because it's a gift and you know 
I don't know if that thought ever really would have sprung up if concerts would have gone away, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, just the notion of practice being for a reason <laughs> uh, besides just the enjoyment of practicing, I think is right. one of the main positive takeaways from COVID. You know, I lost, you know, of course, my whole life changed because of it, but uh, um, I wouldn't have the opportunity to have moved here without, you know, the pandemic happening. Yeah. You know? um, I also lost some really high profile gigs that I was looking forward to. So you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely changed a lot, but um, I'm more okay with just sitting with my instrument for no other reason than because it's pleasurable and fun and feels good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Beautiful. I, I share a lot more online now, you know, I used to just um, practice for a gig, play the gig, people come to the gig, they hear me or they don't, you know, uh, but um, over the past year and a half, I've gone, uh, I, I, I go live on my Instagram I, and uh, my Facebook page for my, my artist profile um, multiple times a week, just for free. Anybody can join in, watch anytime, you know, so that's, that's definitely been a change. Just being okay with playing for free and for nobody but me, <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and what is your website? worldmusician.co that co okay that's right and that's kind of my my home page it has uh um my home home base home page and it has links to my socials you know um all of my i have a ton of information on there so great and do you have any uh, upcoming concerts you can tell us about uh, in person I do. or online i do actually yes been wonderful since I've moved here. I'm just getting all these opportunities to play. Um, things are opening back up to to be in person again. It's it's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. So this Saturday I'll be at Art Omi, which is up here in Ghent, New York. Oh, it's beautiful a, sculpture park there. Beautiful sculpture Gorgeous park. Gorgeous place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be playing among you know. There's a whole music thing happening there on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I'll be there um jamming amongst the sculptures you know it's Amazing. an upstate film or an, yeah it's an upstate films event and they you know feature musicians before the films so i'm luck lucky enough to know those guys and get in there great great and next weekend i'll be at the green kill performance space in kingston um i think the, their seating is limited to 10 in-person seats but it'll be streaming on youtube mm -hmm. so can catch that live or after any time um and it'll be yeah i'll just be going through my my catalog here and, and just just playing playing as much music as i can all right beautiful well yep. we've been talking i'm lucky enough to talk to chris stevens <laughs> about his uh many instruments that he plays uh and giving us insight thank you so yeah, much yeah thank you this. so much it's such a I, joy I've learned a lot tonight, and I'm sure uh, oh, that's, other that's watchers incredible. have. <laughs> and so, please, uh, if you enjoyed this, share it. Let's, you know, it, it's going to be archived at the same location so people can watch it. And uh, next week, uh, we're going to be having a continuation of our social justice series with a panel discussion about Tawaiif's uplifting Tawaiif culture, and uh, which has also been fascinating. Uh, some of the events we've had around that. Um, and we're going to keep going. So, uh, you know, sign our mailing list, brooklynragamassive.org, and you can keep up with our, our weekly events and our in-person concerts. Um, definitely going to have some stuff coming up in the next couple of months. Oh, yeah. Looking forward right. to it. Looking forward to catching you guys live. And uh, Yes, and uh, see meeting you in person soon. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just right up the road from you. Maybe even up right up the river. Right, right. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Neil. I'll see you later.